SJC 11557, Commonwealth v. Marlin Holmes. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm Jane Montori, representing the Commonwealth in this case. This is a case where the dispute is over credit against a sentence. In this case, there is no legal basis to award the defendant credit against his 2003 sentence for a sentence that he served in an unrelated district court case. Would you say that was dead time? I, not in this case, Your Honor, no. I, and it was tipped, and he had served his sentence. He had, he had served his sentence. He was then out of um, confinement for about three years. Um, the, the original sentence was a Springfield district court sentence. He was um, then out of confinement and he um, committed a firearms offense, and he, he, was, he pled guilty and was sentenced in the Superior Court um, on those firearms convictions. He had two 97 drug offenses? One he of them one. this? Um, I thought there were he, two. He may have had two. The other one was... Um, because the, the reason I'm asking, I, I, at least I think, I thought he had two. Yeah, he did. And it, I thought that the other one, not... Well, one of them was, was part of the basis for the second and subsequent offense. That's right. Yes, I'm sorry. The, he only had one conviction um, in, in the case uh, that he was given credit for. That was, I was confused. So here's my question. Um, assume, hypothet I know it's not, or I gather it's not in this case, but let's say that the sentence you have your facts, but one of the underlying crimes that goes to make up the second and subsequent that turns out to be the one that gets um, uh, reversed. Would that make a difference? Yes, it would. Okay, in that, that case, would be dead time. Yes, it would be. Um, I think in that case, then you Maybe go you would back actually, under, um, say, if there was only one remaining conviction, you'd right. go back you'd and go back sentence and get under 10 GA. Yeah, okay. So, so it, it has a bigger... You'd be resentenced. Yes. you get resentenced, yes. Uh, let's imagine we didn't have Marlon Holmes but Reuben Carter. Let's imagine that somebody who was discovered later to be truly innocent uh, emerges and has already served his sentence but is serving time on a wholly unrelated offense. Same result in the interest of justice? If it's a wholly unrelated offense, if it's not a from and after sentence, I would say that yes, in Massachusetts, that should be the outcome. I mean, there are other remedies for defendants who are wrongly convicted, um, but as far as receiving um, sentence, uh, receiving credit against a sentence for an unrelated crime, um, I don't see any legal basis. And, and is that because, I mean, this legal basis, there, there are two principles here. One principle is that we don't like dead time. We don't like people to serve, to be serving time for things that they didn't deserve to. But we're also concerned about the banking time issue. Uh, is is, is the, your reason simply because there's a rule that's unrelated and therefore you don't get credit? Or is your concern that there would be various disincentives and, and diminished deterrence if we were to do this? I think both, Your Honor. I'm concerned about the, um, you know, the under the cases in which this court has determined credit on an equitable basis, it's supposed to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Here, the defendant is asking for a bright line rule. <clears throat> if you've got a prior conviction that's unrelated and you're serving a sentence and that conviction is overturned for whatever reason, um, you then get credit. As long as, um, the, as long as the of offense you're getting the credit against was committed before you got the relief under the sentence, the other sentence, 
I, yes. I'm not saying that very well, but yeah. Well, this, in, in, in cases in which they talk about banking time. Right, that's what I'm talking about. Um, the, the first offense is uh, determined to be um, void. Um, so, but the person has served um, time. They then go out and commit a new offense and then have a new conviction. You can't take that time and apply it against the new conviction. But the banking time argument here is at, at, at least weaker. I mean, it's different from saying, I've got two years that I've banked from that unjust conviction and I can commit a crime which will sentence me to two years and I won't serve a day, so I might as well do what I feel like doing. In this particular circumstance, he had no, he wasn't sure he was going to be able to get that, and so when he committed the crime, he had only the possibility that he'd have bank time, not any assurance. So, I mean, you have to agree that it's, it's a weaker deterrence argument here. Well, it's a factually distinct deterrence argument, but in this case, it awards recidivists, um, which is a, a related but separate policy decision. You should get credit only if you committed another crime. That's right. If you've got a record and you committed a crime, you're getting credit. Whereas if it's a first offender uh, who doesn't have a record or who hasn't um, been committed at all, they, they, they're they not getting time. And um, in that sense, it, there's no sense of finality for a sentencing judge. Well, I guess going back to your earlier point, you said it, 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 it was that, that the a defendant seeks a firm rule that before the rule was one of equity, but it seems like you're looking for a firm rule too. Well, I think I'm I'm relying on the the cases of this court and the appeals court that have said that if it's if it's an unrelated sentence in in the sense of it's, it's not a from and after sentence for an unrelated crime, then the, the credit is not applied, is not awarded. And I, I don't think that's a departure from anything that this court or the appeals court has said. I think um, Justice Sossman um, in Commonwealth versus Morass um, specified the limits of the court's um, equitable uh, powers in this area uh, when she said, um, and I'm quoting from uh, page 117 uh, of 446 Mass, a 2006 case, we have resorted to general principles of fairness <laughs> when confronted with the proper calculation of sentencing credits in cases involving complex sequences of multiple charges and sentences which pose difficulties in determining which charge or charges resulted in the pretrial detention and in calculating which sentence or sentences should receive the credit. And I think that says very well the, the uh, parameters of this court's or the appeals court's decisions in cases in which the equitable principles didn't apply. But I think, um, although the statutes don't apply to this case, I think that they gave, give guidance to this court and have given guidance to the court in terms of not applying credit where the sentences and the crimes are not related as they are in this case. <clears throat> so is it your position that the the place where the appeals court came out, the, the majority of the appeals court, which seemed to me, this is what I want to say, is, is Justice Granger's opinion that if the crime, if the, if the uh, reversal and the, and the, of the prior conviction um, happens after the crime for which the current sentence is, is being served uh, occurred, then you get the dead time. Is that basically what the... That's what the majority's right. decision said. And I 
disagree with his uh, definition of dead time. I think dead time, as it's used in the case law, particularly Manning and the appeals court's decision <laughs> in the, the appeals court Milton case, um, dead time is when there are from and after sentences um, and when the first sentence is um, voided for whatever reason. Um, in that case, um, you then take the second sentence and put it back to where it would have been had there not been that intervening sentence. I think that's the definition of dead time. I think the appeals court- It's very court, limited, it's very limited. The appeals court decision was much too broad in its definition of dead time. And unless the court has any further questions, I would ask that Judge Roop's um, decision be affirmed. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Good morning, may it please the court. I'm Merritt Schnipper for the defendant, Marlon Holmes. I'd like to begin by answering Justice Lank's question uh, to my sister and reading the court's definition of dead time from its decision in Manning which is time served under an invalid sentence for which no credit is given. If credit is not awarded in this case, the defendant will have dead time. He'll have two years of dead time. Wasn't Manning one of the situation that Ms. Montoya was talking about where you had a, a from and after sentence? It did have a from and after sentence, but the court did not ground its decision in the fact that the sentences were from and after. And I think it's important to look at Manning in the context of the rule of Brown that it applied. You know, it said, well, Brown only went so far because it, was at a, it only had to go so far in order to reach a certain result. We go farther and we don't hold ourselves to the technical timing of sentences or the order of imposition, but what we do is look to the remedy for time that cannot be attributed to a, leg a legitimate conviction. And we find a remedy for that severe deprivation of liberty unless a significantly important social counterbalance exists, which is the danger of banking. So you, on the banking side of it, don't we get to worry about what happens with defendants who are serving, well, as uh, uh, the Commonwealth says, recidivists get awarded, rewarded. Um, they, uh, they're serving subsequent uh, sentences for subsequent crimes, and they, for example, on a Crawford kind of violation, look back and say, oh, I was convicted of that and I did time on that and I did time on that, and seek to have motions for new trial uh, to get those things tipped. On this theory, they would be able always to credit them against unrelated subsequent sentences. That's correct. So in other words, is the concern that the only people who could afford themselves to this remedy are people who were serving later imposed sentences? Exactly. right. I mean, I think the way I would frame that is the concern is that there are going to be people out there who have served time under illegitimate sentences who have no remedy. So that to me is the most significant issue. In terms of equitable jurisprudence, it's a question of finding a remedy when a remedy is available. And I agree that it's an unfortunate thing that there would be people, including people who are recidivists, but because of the timing of their, the reversal of their earlier conviction, would not have any remedy for years of their lives spent in confinement under a conviction that's no longer valid. So then they bank time in, in effect, haven't and they? And which is why they could not get credit. That's right. So any sentence imposed for a crime committed after a prior conviction is reversed cannot be a subject of sentencing credit exactly because the deterrent effect of the criminal law would have been So then removed. they get to, for lack of a better choice of words, commit a free crime, don't they? Well, they only commit a free crime if they commit the crime already knowing that they have a, an existing conviction that's reversed, and I'm in no way suggesting that in that situation credit should be awarded. What I'm saying is that so long as the second crime, here the 2003 gun crimes, is committed before the prior sentence is reversed, which in this case happened about six years after those crimes or five years after those crimes, um, then there is no danger of banking because a person cannot have committed the later crime with the belief, or at least any sort of rational belief, that they had time in the bank. And I go to significant uh, length in my brief discussing the efforts that you need to go through, especially with a remote plea uh, that is lacking any contemporaneous record in order to withdraw a guilty plea. I mean, you would really be foolish to consider that time in the bank. That's more like planning on winning the lottery and paying for something with that because it's really- Well, you know, not if you're a serving a sentence and you figure, <coughs> let, me, let me have a go at this because sure. it's gonna reduce my 
you're right. You say, let me have a go at this. And obviously, the plain language of Rule 30 allows you to seek that relief at any time. That's right. But letting me have a go at this and saying, and I think it's fair to say that people who are incarcerated for significant amounts of time have a lot of time to focus on their the crime for which they're currently serving term and their past criminal history and see, to see if there's anything to reverse. But that suggests that it's somehow easy, 8, 10, 11, 12 years after the fact, to go into the district or even the superior court and to reverse a guilty plea. But, but l let me see if I understand this correctly. In this case, it was reversed on the basis of ineffective assistance of counsel, correct? correct. And the Commonwealth uh, could have but chose not to retry, correct? Um, basically, the record doesn't show the Commonwealth's rationale, but it did not choose to retry, and then eventually the defendant's motion to dismiss with, with prejudice was granted in 2007. I, is there, go, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, it just seems to me that your, your rule, or the appeals court rule, is going to then encourage the Commonwealth to proceed to retry this 1997 case in whenever because, because of this trying to avoid this consequence, or it might. Well, if it encourages the Commonwealth to proceed on a criminal charge that believes it has evidence for and can prove, then that should be a welcome result. I mean, the idea is that to the extent possible, we want time served in prison or jail to be tied to the crime charged. And if time is served and it can no longer be tied to the crime charge because the conviction under which that time was served has now been shown to be legally illegitimate, then the next best thing that we can do for people in that situation is if there's a remedy because they're serving some other lengthier time, attribute that time to a valid conviction. But, but why wouldn't the better remedy be to afford that person some, some kind of financial compensation uh, under the wrongful conviction statute because the victim of the subsequently committed crime all of a sudden is going to see this person out on the street and never having spent a day in jail for the crime that was committed against him or her. Well, I, I mean, I know certainly in this situation, for instance, the defendant served over 10 years of right, prison but, time but on this. Theoretically so you theoretically could have two sentences that were of the same length. Um, so I do think, I mean, there certainly is the potential for a financial compensation alternative to this equitable remedy that this court has <coughs> fashioned. As currently written, the wrongful conviction statute requires you know, evidence showing, tendency to show factual innocence, which yeah. is a different question here from a constitutionally invalid, although I think factually supported earlier conviction. Would, would in, in this case, um, well, let, let me ask this, and I should know this, but the, what is, what case of this court adopts the, the rationale that the appeals court did here, the majority? It's really a straight, forward interpretation of the Manning decision, which is that, but, sorry. But, well, it's just that Manning is different because- Manning is factually different in that it has the consecutive sentences, but the rule of Manning is not tied to the, and in fact, well, they, the, I'll just read the way the um, Manning court framed the question presented. The problem is not when a sentence is imposed, but what to do for a prisoner who has served time under a sentence that is reversed. Okay. But, all right, let me rephrase my question. Is there any case of this court that is factually like this one. I don't mean on all fours, but you, you know what I mean. I mean, in, in a situation like this where you have a, a <coughs> period of liberty in interrupting the two sentences. No, I don't think there is. And I would place this case squarely in the line of Brown, Manning, and then now this case. Because Brown begins by saying we're not, you know, a from and after sentence, but we're not simply going to begin that sentence credit from the date of the reversal. We're going to begin it from the date of imposition. Manning goes further and says we're going to credit from prior to the date of imposition because, you know, I think the reason that Brown and Manning took an equitable approach is that the severity of the deprivation of the liberty interest here is extreme. And there's, unless we have a very serious and compelling social interest to counterbalance that deprivation, it's just simply not fair to require a person to absorb dead time. So I think. You know, the rule that the appeals court applied, the rule of Manning, fully preserves the deterrent effect of the criminal law, which really is the primary purpose beyond individualized punishment of the criminal law. So the defendant can get credit here. The deterrent purpose of the criminal law can remain in full effect, and this court's equitable jurisprudence can be honored. I mean, you know, because we're in equity, we have to do what we can for the people before the court. If there is a situation where there is no equitable remedy because it would imperil other socially important objectives, then dead time may have to be absorbed, as in this court's uh, Milton decision, it, it was. 
you know, it's not a happy outcome when a person serves 15 months in prison for an armed robbery charge and they're acquitted at trial and then are told sorry that that time was lost, but there are socially important enough interests to require that outcome. But in this case, that social interest just is not implicated to that extent. If there are no further questions, I'll rest on my brief. All right, thank you, Counsel. Thank you.